The Veil of Moses Removed, Does the Bible Teach Premillennialism? by Rev. D. Earl Kripe. Read by Eric J. Miller. Read more at godspointofview.com. A copy of this book is available from Amazon in Kindle and paperback format. Link in the description. Chapter 16. A Fair Show in the Flesh. Lastly, we'd like to discuss some comments St. Paul had on the topic of Christian Zionism. As many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. For neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, but desire to have you circumcised, that they may glory in your flesh. But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace be on them, and mercy, and upon the Israel of God. From henceforth let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ. Brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Galatians chapter 6, verses 12 through 18. St. Paul says that those who desire to make a fair show in the flesh are the ones who are interested in pomp and religious pageantry and liturgy of the old law. They do this so that they can imply importance and achievement in the religious world by the size of their following and the way they force you to conform to their religious theater. In each of these types of movements, there is no emphasis upon self-denial, personal devotion, freedom in the spirit, and closeness to God in the individual life. All of the emphasis is on how you can be convinced to join up, to be a part, to send away for something, to get into some mind manipulation class, to learn to do something by rote that will add numbers and power to the particular organization that has given birth to the movement. This is what most of the so-called Christianity of today is all about, and after which most of the religious people are running like hounds after a bitch in heat. Those who are the heads of such groups as these are building their reputations by the numbers that follow them and the nature of the rituals into which people are being lured and snared. Many of them are egotists, grafters, womanizers, and worse. The sad part is that in this world, they do not have to have any personal integrity. The saps that have been snared by them are guilty of hero worship of these personality cultists. They do not want to know the truth about that person, and they do not care. It is a world where insincere people can get high on the opiate of religion, and they do not have to die to themselves. The flesh loves this kind of sensual, emotional, intellectual, financial, religious orgy. It is this very thing of which the Apostle speaks. Many things and movements in the religious world fall into this category. There is the mind manipulation of the church growth principle and evangelism explosion, the greed of prosperity preaching, the intellectual and egotistical pride of the theology of reason and apologetics, the emotional and sensual turn-ons of charismatic humanism with its faked miracles and feigned spirituality, theonomy, reconstruction, moral majority, the religious right, and the competitiveness, hatred, anger, and other cultural and carnal expressions of the political reformers. But none is more characteristic of those who desire to make a fair show in the flesh than the ones St. Paul is taking on in the book of Galatians, the dispensationalists, premillennialists, and other constituents of the Old Testament heresy of Christian Zionism. This humanistic religious system, which glorifies man and denies the doctrine of the depravity of Adam's children, is the exemplification of those who desire to make a fair show in the flesh, and the reason is exactly as St. Paul describes it. It is so that they will not have to suffer persecution for the sake of the cross of Christ. They can get together and use their imaginations, the intellectual and scholarly blindness of the natural mind, and their oratorical skills to promote an all-pervasive doctrine for religion that ignores entirely the cursing of the nation by Christ in Luke chapter 11. Then answered one of the lawyers, and said unto him, Master, thus saying thou reproachest us also. 
And he said, Woe unto you also, ye lawyers, for ye laid men with burdens grievous to be borne, and ye yourselves touch not the burdens with one of your fingers. Woe unto you, for ye build the sepulchres of the prophets, and your fathers killed them. Truly ye bear witness that ye allow the deeds of your fathers, for they indeed killed them, and ye build their sepulchres. Therefore also said the wisdom of God, I will send them prophets and apostles, and some of them they shall slay and persecute. That the blood of all the prophets, which was shed from the foundation of the world, may be required of this generation, from the blood of Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, which perished between the altar and the temple. Verily I say unto you, it shall be required of this generation. Woe unto you, lawyers, for ye have taken away the key of knowledge. Ye entered not in yourselves, and them that were entering in ye hindered. Luke chapter 11, verses 45 through 52. They ignore the invalidating of the covenant, the taking of the kingdom from the nation of Israel in St. Matthew chapter 21. Therefore say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you, and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. Matthew chapter 21, verse 43. The Christian Zionists ignore the fact that Jesus made the house of Israel desolate, and that they would never again know him unless they came to him through repentance and faith, even as others do. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. Matthew chapter 23, verse 38. And in St. Luke chapter 13, verse 35, Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. And verily I say unto you, Ye shall not see me until the time come when ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. The Christian Zionist disregards the fact that no one was ever given eternal life as a result of natural birth. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. John chapter 3, verse 3. He ignores the reality that no one can enter the kingdom of God physically unless he is born again physically by the resurrection. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 50. The Christian Zionist has contempt for the fact that there is only one body of Christ. There is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 through 6. The Christian Zionist sneers at the biblical teaching that all redeemed people, both Jews and Gentiles, are brought together as a new man in Christ into this one body, according to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 13 through 22. But now, in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross." having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were afar off, and to them that were nigh. For through him we both have access by one Spirit unto the Father. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints, and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone." in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth into an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 13 through 22. Why does the Christian Zionist close his eyes and harden his neck against these great New Testament truths? Why does he want to push Christ, the church, 
the resurrection, and the heavenly city and tabernacle into the background and bring the nation of Israel to the front? The answer is tragically simple. In his self-righteousness and creature worship, he wants to make a fair show in the flesh. While he speaks of the cross, he disdains the cross, wishing to make the focus of time and history a people who will take the center stage of world religion without being born again or coming by way of the cross. In so doing, he is not really worshiping the Jews, but himself. He argues that God is eternally bound to these flesh and blood descendants of Adam, even though the covenant was conditional and they rejected and crucified Christ. When all the debris is swept away and the foundation of this doctrine is exposed, self-righteous man is at the bottom of it. It is a way of saying that he really is good and really has attracted God and merited his favor as a child of Adam in this world without the cross and the new creation. It is exactly this heresy towards which St. Paul directs the strongest condemnation in all of his letters. You fools, he cries out, how could you possibly be taken in by this kind of gobbledygook after having seen the pure gospel of grace through the eyes of faith? It is inconceivable that this could happen. No wonder he accused them of being under the spell of witchcraft to Christian Zionism, the witch. No one in the world of Christian Zionism today could hold a candle to St. Paul when it comes to zeal and dedication to the Jewish cause. But St. Paul had had his eyes opened. He had seen Christ and he understood the cross. The murderous unbelief of Israel was just another sad chapter in the vices of the children of Adam. And the failed and canceled covenant to that nation of Israel was a dead and faded memory of that which was not, because it could never be. As we started off this chapter, St. Paul said, But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. Galatians 6, 14. There is one thing, and only one, for the child of God in this world to glory in, and that is the cross of Jesus Christ. And what is the reason for that? It is twofold. It is by the cross that the world is crucified unto me. This world, which is crucified to us, is the precious realm of the Christian Zionist, where, according to the misguided and fatally flawed doctrines, Christ is going to return and yet show all men what a wonderful world this is and can be when it is ruled over by a powerful and just king. For all his talk about fundamental Christianity, the Christian Zionist simply has not gotten the message that the world is corrupt, that natural-born man is corrupt, and that only the cross and the resurrection can make man good. There is one truly Christian attitude, and one only. It is to get free from this old creation by death with Christ on the cross, and in resurrection with him. The cross of Jesus Christ destroys the old creation. Part of that old creation is the flesh and blood children and the geographical land of Israel. Only by death and resurrection. Granted, that may be true, but what about the physical kingdom of God? The answer is that the kingdom of God is not of this world any longer. Jesus said it plainly to Pilate. You can only get into the kingdom of God in any sense that is relative to us, whether it is in the spirit, the soul, or the body, by death with Christ, resurrection with Christ, and new life in Christ. Through the cross, everything that is of this old creation is dead. Christ made it dead with his life as he lived it, the kingdom he taught, his death, and his resurrection. When the world rejected the king of glory, they rejected everything of value, and when Christ rejected the world as a place to reign over, he made it all meaningless, useless, and expendable. But what about the I unto the world? What about us being crucified unto the world? The world is set in the heart of natural man. It is endemic to his mortal nature. He is a product of the world. He is made from the red clay of the world. 
He is sustained physically by the food that grows out of the ground of this world. Man came into this world, and he is here by way of the old creation. As long as man is alive mortally, he is tied to the world. Romans chapter 7 makes this so very clear. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin which were by the law did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Romans chapter 7, verses 4 through 6. What does this say? Only death breaks the bondage to the world and the covenant of the flesh. Only death with Christ results in new life in the new creation. St. Paul struggled with this reality as it applies to sanctification and the Christian life in Philippians chapter 3. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord to write the same things to you. To me, indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the concision. For we are the circumcision, which worship God in the Spirit, and rejoice in Jesus Christ, and have no confidence in the flesh. If any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Circumcise the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Jesus Christ. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Jesus Christ. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded, and if in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Nevertheless, whereunto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us mind the same thing. Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an ensample. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you, even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Philippians chapter 3, verses 1 through 21. Here the apostle is also warning the church against Christian Zionism. There are evil workers whose minds are on the flesh and the world. They think in terms of national Israel, the physical world, and the old creation. St. Paul had more in the regard to glorying than they did, but he would not do it. He saw it all as rubbish to be thrown away. His preoccupation was with dying to all that was of the old creation so that he could experience resurrection with Christ and know the new world, the righteousness by faith, and the marvelous will of God for his life. St. Paul was not talking about the future, but about the present time. His place in the resurrection on the last day had long since been assured. 
But the resurrection today is another matter. It requires constant death to self and resurrection with Christ. Yesterday's victories will not do for today. As long as we are in this world, we have never reached the apex. We must press on. In Colossians chapter 3, the truth is expressed as to how this is achieved in justification and how it can be achieved in sanctification. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on the things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. Those who have been resurrected with Christ, in terms of sanctification, spend their time and their emotions and efforts on those things which are above, at the throne of God, where Christ sits on the right hand of God. This is telling us that for God and his Son, Jesus Christ, only things of the new creation are of importance. Clearly, this is the meaning because it is contrasted to things on this earth. The Natural and the Spiritual Those who are preoccupied with an earthly kingdom over in Palestine and things which will minister to the natural man are not raised with Christ, at least in the sense of sanctification and how they live their lives. But this must not be true of the faithful. We are to set our affections on things above. The reason is simple. The faithful have died with Christ as it pertains to the old creation, and they are no longer interested in the things of the old creation. Why would they be? The old creation is only of interest to those who have not died to it. Hidden with Christ in God But our lives are hidden with Christ in God. This means that the things which occupy our affections and comprise our service are not visible to, or of importance to, those who desire to make a fair show in the flesh. The Christian Zionist is preoccupied with this earth and a kingdom into which those who are not born again and who are not physically immortal can come and participate. It does not matter to him that they have not died to the old creation. Their affections are here. Their stuff is here and their glory is their shame. They uphold those as the chosen of God that Jesus called liars, murderers, hypocrites, and children of the devil. These are the ones who crucified their king, the Lord of glory, and said, Away with him, we do not want him, you take him, he is not our king. Yet the fools of the world of Christian Zionism have the temerity to claim that God is so enamored with these vessels of wrath fitted to destruction that he would come back, give them this mortal kingdom of the old creation, and accede to their wishes. This is the epitome of heresy and sacrilege. It is just another in the age-long examples of the insane, impertinent, and irreverent rantings of the fallen mind. St. Paul made a summary statement on this subject in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, when he said, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge, that if one died for all, then were all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them, and rose again. Wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh, yea, Though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new, and all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God to him. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14-21 through 21. Here the apostle tells us that with the crucifixion and the resurrection, everything that was of the old creation is gone. Even Christ, the man after the flesh and the Jew. 
For those who are in Christ, and the context here is Christian service and consequences in the day of judgment for how we have lived our lives, everything is of the new creation. The old creation is gone forever. Our preoccupation is with the responsibility to spread the gospel to men in this world as ambassadors for Christ before the second coming and the end of the world that it brings. The basis of that gospel is that we can be reconciled to God through the cross of Jesus Christ and the grace given to us by him and it. It is through faith and it is offered to every man who will hear and be reconciled. We could go on endlessly, almost, with this subject because the whole theology of the Christian life is anchored to it, but it is enough for those who will listen, and more would not help those who would not. Editor's Note This chapter has been an addition to the group of articles that Rev. Kripe originally compiled and comes from his commentary on the book of Galatians. End of chapter 16 of The Veil of Moses Removed by Rev. D. Earl Kripe Read by Eric J. Miller Afterward, Answer a fool, answer not a fool. We have defended the historic, orthodox view that the Church is the city of God in this present world against the bitter attacks of Christian Zionism, also known as premillennialism or dispensationalism. With this, we are going to end this discussion now. There are a dozen or more other subjects that we could have included, but if the point is not made by now, it is not going to be made. As for those other issues, we have books on Romans, Galatians, Ephesians, Hebrews, and Revelation that give the orthodox answers of the historic church for those who are seeking truth. The late, great Arthur W. Pink, a man widely regarded as the best expository Bible teacher in the last 200 years, turned zealously against premillennialism in his later life. So vexed was Pink for having been in the vanguard of those who promoted these Jewish fables that he went so far as to label it a demonic doctrine. I take my stand with A.W. Pink on this point. Premillennialism teaches that the depraved, natural-born children of Adam are promised eternal life by God because of their nationality. It argues that those who murdered Jesus mean more to God than his lovely bride, the church. It holds that the theme of time and history is not the mission of the church and the salvation of the world through faith in Christ, but the salvaging of the nation of Israel. That doctrine is no friend of the gospel. It is a doctrine so damnable that only the devil could have schemed it up. Therefore, Pink's analysis that it is demonic is right on, in our view. As a parting thought, I wish to say that I, and those who rest their faith on the revealed scriptures as I do, take it kindly when we are called heretics, people who do not believe the Bible anymore, one who does not believe in the second coming anymore, and all of the other poisonous accusations designed to intimidate and to scare people away. Jesus said to rejoice and to be exceedingly glad when that happened because it puts one in good company. I appreciate being in that company. I am glad when it happens, and I am rejoicing because of it. In the end analysis, Christ and his kingdom will accomplish his work in this world, and he will do it through the church of the living God, the Israel of God. Thanks be to God who always causes us to triumph in Jesus Christ. In a very short time now, I will be standing before my Maker and my Savior and answering for my 47 years of expository Bible teaching. I am anxious to do that and hear what God has to say about it. How about you? Rev. D. Earl Kripe, a born child in the new creation by the incorruptible sperm of God, a brother and companion in the tribulation, a fellow worker in the kingdom, and a king and a priest unto God. End of Afterward of The Veil of Moses Removed by Rev. D. Earl Kripe, read by Eric J. Miller. Read more at GodsPointOfView.com. A copy of this book is available from Amazon in Kindle and paperback format. Link in the description.